Hello everyone, welcome to episode 38 of Driver Soup Blog Radio. As always, I'm your host David G. Firestone. I've had another slew of technical problems. I don't get technical problems that often, but when I do, well, when it rains it pours. So I've finally gotten this project done that I've been wanting to do for a while, so this week is going to be a little different. Most times when I talk about an item, it's something that I currently own. This is one of the very rare cases where the eBay purchase in question had to be canceled, and it's not for any real major reason, but it's not worth getting into here. I'm about to post a photo of the item momentarily, but I have to set things up first. Now, when I got into collecting, I started collecting hockey stuff, and then I sort of moved over to racing, and then just stuff that interests me, and lottery stuff interests me, even though I only play lottery for YouTube. Now, one of the weird things I've gotten into in recent months is lottery test tickets or tickets that were made to be inspected by the lotteries uh, for quality assurance purposes that have since been encased in Lucite in one form or another. And I'll do something on my the bulk of my collection later on. Unfortunately, the only one that I wanted was the one I didn't get. And it's this ticket right here. This is a 1986 ticket that was one of the first tickets printed at a printing pl- at the uh, lottery printing plant in Gilroy, California, which was home of the famous Gilroy Garlic Festival. Now, the ticket itself is really nothing to speak of, your classic 80s long lottery ticket. It's very long and thin. I kind of wish th- that lotteries would go back to this, but I don't know. But it's not so much the ticket itself, but the rabbit hole that I went down while researching this, because the backstory behind this just gets really crazy. And understand why, we have to start at the very beginning of the California lottery. Now in California, the Lottery Act of 1984 was presented to voters in November of that year as a ballot proposition, specifically Prop 37, which passed with 58% of the popular vote. Prop 37 mandated an extremely tight timeline for establishing the lottery and bringing it to operational status. As a direct result, the governor appointed the first lottery commissioners on January 29, 1985. The state government immediately built the lottery's original headquarters in only three months in the Richards neighborhood of Sacramento, where it still resides today. Like many other state lotteries, California does not print their own tickets as a uh, conflict of interest law is in effect, but they use a company called Light and Wonder Inc., which was formerly Scientific Games Corporation. I will be referring to Scientific Games Corporation as SGC. Now, this company was um, hired to design and print the tickets, but they didn't actually print them. They... Uh, They implemented the tickets, they designed the tickets, but to print the tickets at the time, SGC used Dittler Brothers Inc. of Atlanta, which was a printing company specializing in lottery ticket printing. Now, if that name sounds a little familiar, it'll become clear much later on. Now, the partnership between Dittler and SGC is where the problems start. Now, SGC was aware of how lucrative this contract was would be, first off, and I don't know how any of this is legal, by the way, they were the firm that wrote the lottery initiative, and of the $2.4 million spent to finance the measure, uh, SGC put up $2.2 million, which, to put that in perspective, in today's money, that would be um, SGC $2.2 million is about $6,205,000 of the $2.4 million, or six. $6,769,000. $6,769,000. They were lobbying, lobbying all over the state of California for Prop 37 to pass. Now, if that sounds kind of sketchy, buckle up. When it became clear that Prop 37 was going to pass and they had gotten the contract, um, they started their own ticket printing location in Gilroy, California in September 1984, two months before the lottery initiative passed. Yes, you heard that right. Two months before the vote even took place, 
SGC started building a plant, and this is not uh, uh, this is a literally a six million dollar plant in 1984 dollars, which is like s- almost 17 million dollars today. If you're wondering how any of this is legal, I don't blame you. I can't see how this would possibly be legal in today's environment. But it became clear that there were going to be issues with the tight deadlines because the Gilroy plant was kept secret in much the same way that Walt Disney bought land for in Orlando for Disney World. They kept the reasoning for purchasing everything secret. Um, now, the debut of California's lottery was October 3rd, 1985, but there's going to be issues that came into play because the Gilroy plant came into conflict with Esch, with Scientific's um, contract with Dittler Brothers, who at the time, the deal was exclusive, meaning they had to print every single lottery ticket for Scientific Games. The problem with this is that Dittler Brothers, even at full capacity, was not nearly as capable as keeping up with the demands set by uh, Scientific Games by the state of California, and everyone involved knew it. And never mind the uh, costs of transporting, the costs and logistics of transporting these tickets from Atlanta, Georgia to San Francisco, or Sacramento, I'm sorry. So the having no other real option, Scientific Games built the Gilroy plant. So with a lot to lose and really not much to gain from this new arrangement, Dittler Brothers Inc. sued S, uh, Scientific Games. Now, initially, the judge in this case, Osgood Williams, my new favorite judge name, on June 14, 1985, ruled that Scientific Games had to use Dittler as the main supplier. But then it also gave Dittler 75 days, the entire time that the state of California was along for the pr- production of tickets before the rollout to basically produce 700 million tickets for two different games. So that's 350 million tickets per game. It quickly became apparent that this was not going to work, and this led to another series of court battles leading up to uh, June 30th, 1986. Now that date's going to become important momentarily. So in the uh, weeks leading up to uh, June 30th, some new facts became clear, and it was clear that California was not happy with Dittler's work to the point that they told Scientific Games, look, you're going to fire Dittler or you're not getting the contract. Now, this would cost the company $32 million, and given how much they'd spent, that would put the company in serious financial jeopardy. Now, it was also emerged that Dittler had supposedly overcharged Scientific Games for materials, and this, and while uh, Dittler denied this, this was discovered by a court arbit- auditor arbitrator. And so there was a whole series of lawsuits there. This would cul- culminate in uh, Scientific Games finally opening their new ticket plant on June 30th, 1986, when this ticket was produced and encased in, um, encased in Lucite. Now, while the S, the Scientific Games Dittler feud would go on a little longer, there was a 1991 lawsuit considering the, Flor- the Florida lottery. Dittler was at this point just a spent force. Now, Dittler would find out how worse it could get because their reputation would be further tainted through a little thing called the McDonald's monopoly fraud. So. I'll give you just a brief version of this. Jerome Paul Jacobson, the mastermind behind this story, and Dittler crossed paths in the early 1980s when uh, Jacobson was hired as a security guard for Dittler through an outside company. Dittler, who in conjunction with Simon Marketing, created the first McDonald's Monopoly game back in 1987. Dittler, who was in charge of delivery and uh, various other things for uh, Simon, quickly figured out how to move top pieces to allies and quickly did. Now this went on for many years until 2001 when the whole scheme came to light. And um, with the exception of one guy who died in a car wreck, Jacobson and all his allies would spend time in jail. In interviews over the years, Jacobson has said that if if given the chance, he would not hesitate to do it all over again. 
I've not been able to find when specifically Dittler Brothers went out of business, but I do know that the uh, name is now being used by a law firm in Atlanta. So, I mean, it is what it is. And th I've never done research on one singular item and goes down such a weird, unusual rabbit hole. I've never had that kind of thing happen to me when I'm doing research. It just kept going. And I've left out a lot for the sake of time and simplicity. So I had to share this all with you. Okay, I've talked about lottery tickets for enough. We're going to take a break, and I'm going to talk about Formula One in America. Well, I'm back. I've been vocal about my feelings in Formula One in the U.S. for the time being, but I'll say them again. And this is just not to Formula One. This is any entity that wants to enter the American market. You need to understand that if you want to enter the American market, it's our sandbox. You might think you're entitled to play in it, but you will have to play by our rules. There are a lot of entities that understand this logic and abide by it and succeed. Then there are others who seem to think that they're above the rules and that everyone's going to have to change their way of doing things to accommodate them, and it doesn't happen. I remember when the uh, president of Tupperware, or I think it's parent company, threatened to pull out of the American market because Americans, are, um, Americans prefer value over quality, which was what he said. Meanwhile, you're producing some of the most overpriced stuff for what you're getting, so you don't really understand the American market as well as you think you do. Now, entities that don't get this logic, they don't do well at all. You're not going to shake things up. You're not going to take things over. We make the rules, not you. You don't want to change your habits for us, then fine. But if we don't want to change our habits for you, then fine. We don't need you period. Now, Formula One, while they seem to understand this, many of their fans don't. And for the life of me, I don't understand. I, I, I get why some of their fans seem to think that they're hot stuff in, in America, but they're really not. And I'll get to that a little later. Now, while, he seems, now, while I say it seems like F1, the entity, understands, their announcement about how the Las Vegas Grand Prix is going to take place makes me question whether or not they're capable of, because I don't think it's any big story with that for decades. Formula One has tried to get a foothold in the American racing market. Now, unfortunately, they've done very little, if anything, to capture the hearts of America, which is kind of a major thing if you want a piece of our pie. Now, why do I say this? Well, during the major racing boom of the mid to late 1990s, where was Formula One? I can tell you where they weren't, in the United States. They had no presence in American racing at all. Only in recent years has the sport been able to push themselves into the American picture. But let's talk about how desperate F1 wanted to be a fixture in the United States. Now. While the U.S. Grand Prix is primarily associated with Formula One, it was actually held first held in 1908 off and on, but it wasn't a part of Formula One until 1959. Now, Formula One, the U.S. Grand Prix, has had races at Sebring, Riverside, Watkins Glen, the Phoenix Street Circuit, the Indianapolis Road Course, and current Circuit of Americas. Now, that does not include the races held at the Dallas Grand Prix, the Detroit Grand Prix, the U.S. Grand Prix West at Long Beach, and the Caesars Palace Grand Prix that was held in the Caesars Palace parking lot. You had, at one point, several, I think in the 1980s, you had three races in America, despite, again, never capturing the hearts or minds of Americans, which is kind of baffling to me. 
So after 2005, the U.S. Grand Prix was far from a guaranteed draw, but has since proven itself to be profitable. In addition, you have the Miami Grand Prix, which the jury is still out as to how long it can last and how long it will last. So now, in 2023, you're having the Las Vegas Grand Prix hit in the streets in, in the Las Vegas Strip. Okay, sounds interesting, sounds good, makes sense, TV numbers are good, fan base is growing. You have a decent amount of American racing fans who watch the sport. So, how in the world do you manage to piss all of them off with the Las Vegas Grand Prix? Well, let's look at what they did. First off, you're holding the event on November 18th, which is a few weeks after the end of NASCAR and the NHRA for the season, the two biggest local competitors to Formula One. This makes the fans very happy. This also means that the TV numbers will be bigger because there is no real racing competition. And because this is a Saturday night, you avoid conflict with the National Football League because a lot of racing fans in America are also predetermined to like football as it really is our national sport at this point. So then you have a lot of good things that are happening. You have a lot of great decisions made, you take all that excitement and happiness and you throw it up, you throw it in a dumpster and light the dumpster on fire by announcing that the 2023 Las Vegas Grand Prix will have a start time of 10 p.m. local time, which is um, mountain time, which makes it 11 p.m. central and 12 a.m. eastern. What the hell? Do you really want a place in the American market? Because you've spent decades trying to get a foothold in America. You have a street race that everybody was excited for. And then you go out of your way to make it inaccessible to many people in the country you're trying to get a foothold in. Someone explain. Why not have it at 7 p.m.? Because at least with that, it would start at 10 p.m. New York time, but it would be more accessible to a lot of fans. I just don't get this. Who made this call? And for that matter, why was this call ever made? It's clear to everyone, and I've said this before, Formula One thinks that because they're the top dog in international racing, they should be the top dog in American racing. Never gonna happen. But Formula One can't seem to understand that the only people preventing them from a bigger piece of the pie, of the American racing pie, are Formula Ones themselves. You have the night race in Miami, which conflicts with a popular race at NASCAR track. I haven't seen the IndyCar. Um, I haven't seen IndyCar's season yet. To the U.S. Grand Prix, which takes place in Texas during football season, I don't know how you manage to keep making that mistake. If either one of the Texas teams are playing at home, you're not even the biggest sports story in your area. Then you have the Las Vegas Grand Prix starting at midnight Eastern time. It's amazing to me how little thought is placed here. You want to play in our sandbox, you got to play by our rules. If you're really serious about America, you just have to accept where you are on the totem pole, who you are in regards to America, and go from there. You're not going to reinvent the wheel in this country, so don't try. Now, I'm going to say this. I'm going to piss off quite a few people. I really don't care. People need to start hearing this. While you might be the biggest international sanctioning body in racing, America does not, has never, and never will need Formula One. Did the racing community suffer during all the times Formula One wasn't in America? No. And I don't want to make, I don't want to misconstrue this. I want F1 to succeed, but it's clear that whoever's making these calls doesn't understand how the racing market works in the United States. This approach is not only going to get new viewers, it's going to lose a lot of current viewers. Again, play by our rules and you can succeed.
If you don't want to play by our rules, so long, good luck. That's all there is to it. <sighs> well, that about does it for this week. I'm going to work on some more things this week, so I'm not sure what's going to happen. But I'll think of something, and I'll see you next week for episode 39 of Driver's Suit Blog Radio.